Well, hey, everyone. Welcome. Happy New Year. I'm so happy to be back and to be with all of you. I couldn't wait for today to happen. So I hope you're all doing really well. I hope you had a wonderful holiday and that you learned a lot and you have a lot to celebrate for 2018. And I would always love to know. So you're always more than welcome to communicate with me, connect with me anytime you want. And you know you can do that at Marilyn at MarilynShannon.com. Find me on Facebook, find me on Twitter, Marilyn Listens. You can find me on Instagram. Anyway, I'm so happy to have you. And remember, always, this is this show is for you, for me, for the world. So always feel free to connect during the show. We have three different ways you can do that. You can come in in our chat. You can put your name right near the video and enter in there. You can ask questions. You can communicate anything you like. You can call in on a phone at 919-518-9773, or you can come in on Skype, voice to computers, that's plural, the number 2K voice, also during the show. And I truly encourage you, invite you to come in, because we'd love to hear from you. So before we get on with our show, and before I introduce my guest to you, I want to say hi to Amnon. Hello, Marilyn. How are you? Did you miss me? I missed you I a lot. I missed you, too. I miss, oh, my buddy, I'm not. I don't know what I would do with and him. And it's been so cold. I don't even that, want to go there. Can't uh, even imagine. This is, you know, everybody laughs because we are in North Carolina, and the temperature has been so cold for so many days. I've never in my entire life right. down here experienced this, so it's been kind of crazy. But anyway, we're on the upswing in temperature, and then, of course, it'll be, get cold again, but it's been very cold here. So on with our show. We are really excited to have our next guest on. And she I can't wait to talk to her. Because, you know, reading about somebody and listening to an, a video or a TED Talk about somebody is nothing compared to actually seeing them in real life like we get to do here today. So I want to welcome Dr. Olympia LaPointe to our show today. She is a scientist. She's an author. And she's beautiful. So welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm excited to be on your show and, and to answer any type of questions that uh, people have about science and the brain and rocket science and, and to help people start off with 2008 great. Well, that's one. Oh, that's I love one. to hear that. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, there's that that slogan phrase we always say, well, I'm not a rocket scientist, but <laughs> we got one right here right now. So tell everybody who you are. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, I am Olympia LaPointe. Uh, people know me as an award-winning rocket scientist. Uh, they have seen my TED Talk, Reprogramming Your Brain to Overcome Fear, where I talk about uh, launching and helping launch with a great team of people, 28 missions to space. And I worked for the uh, Boeing company at the time who uh, worked for NASA. And I sat in mission control, uh, helping launch the space shuttle and other engines into outer space. And so I was really thankful to have that job. And now what I do with the science is I am a part-time mathematics professor. And the same math and science that I use to launch uh, rockets into space, I now help people use that same math and science and apply it to the brain so they can unleash their own brain power. So first of all, tell us a little bit also about, well, before we go there, when you say working for NASA, what was the piece that you actually did? Oh, yeah. I, I am classically trained as a mathematician. And mathematics goes into so many different aspects of science. And uh, well, I first started off in science and rocket science. And so in doing that, I use mathematics and probability and statistics to calculate the, the probability of catastrophic explosions within flight. My job was literally to... Uh, predict and prevent major explosions that would take out a vehicle and as well as uh, take out astronauts. And so our job was to completely make sure that everything was going to be safe. So you started working for NASA and Boeing when exactly? When I was 21 years old. And it was the most interesting thing because uh, when I started there, I had always had a desire to become a rocket scientist. Um, when people watch my TED talk, they see that I wanted to become a rocket scientist at the age of six when I went to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And there I thought, oh my God, it would be great to uh, be a scientist. But I did not realize that I was completely different than all the rest of the scientists that uh, 
are there. <laughs> uh, I, and I, it, it took years for me to recognize that uh, my background being a woman of color was completely different than the other people in which I would later on encounter. And uh, when I became a rocket scientist at the age of 21, I was um, really brought into a realization. Uh, the realization was that not only did I have to find a way to bring the science to people so they could understand and appreciate uh, the information that it would give so we could make wise decisions. Uh, but it was also realizing that there was a way that people could think, an opened way of the mind so people could think, so they could not only see facts, but take away any type of fear involved. And uh, it was interesting because being a person, a woman of color, uh, it was uh, it was challenging. I, I'm not going to lie. It was very challenging, but I rose to the occasion and was able to help uh, engineers in, of any background be able to understand not only the science, but how to look at different ways of seeing things so they too can open their mind to the great possibilities that exist. So and I, I, have, I have a couple of questions, but I have to interrupt you a second. So yeah. what it, was it about your background that, that, that kind of instilled something in you? that you knew something beyond, that you wanted to share? I mean, what, what was it from your background that you had that you took into being a rocket scientist? Well, I always wanted to make a difference in the world. I mean, that sounds so uh, uh, cliche, but I realized I always wanted to make a difference. No matter what I did, I wanted to use my life to be able to create something new and to better it no matter what it was. And at first, I had to do that with my own life first, and later on I could do that in the lives of other people. But it was that, um, it was kind of like a decision that I made at a very young age that no matter what, no matter what I would encounter, no matter the types of uh, challenges I would face, I was going to find a way to be able to introduce something into the world in which would not only benefit myself, but help other people as well. Yeah. So your childhood? Mm -hmm. Had some uh, my child, elements. Yeah. Yes. So, what was it about yeah. your childhood? I came from uh, not the greatest childhood. It's probably the one of the, the most uh, dysfunctional childhoods that can exist, and that's why I'm so thankful to be able to write about that in my new book, Answers Unleashed. Uh, no matter what type of background we've come from, there's always a way to be able to change our thinking and then change our lives, no matter what type of situational resources or, or whatever it is that we experience. And for my particular life, I became a rocket scientist, but most people are completely shocked because uh, I grew up in complete poverty. Uh, there was times that we didn't have any food and we would trick ourselves to think that we were eating by chewing on ice and this damaged our teeth and everything else. But it was like, it was the reality of the situation. I would go to school because I was just so happy to learn and to get a meal that sometimes that, that was the only meal I had during the day. Uh, it's, it's a real thing when students are starving when they're in school. Uh, and then I grew up also in the middle of gang violence since this was in the 1980s in Los Angeles when the crack a house epidemic and drug epidemic was heightened to uh, a big deal. Even we saw it within TV shows of Miami Vice in, in the 1980s. Uh, and it was here in Los Angeles. And uh, it was it was very difficult because we grew up next to a crack house. And I remember our mother having a sleep in a certain direction in the bed. So and she put up this metal against the wall. So if the bullets came to the wall, it would hopefully hit the metal. And if it didn't hit the metal, it wouldn't hit our head. So it was, a, it was a very tough situation, and uh, it, it wasn't just uh, in the outside world, it was actually in the classroom as well. I remember sitting next to a, a person uh, who was already recruited into a gang at the age of 10, and when he was recruited into the gang, um, it, was, it was really tough because uh, he was a person um, who didn't know how to control his anger, and we got into an argument, and he stop me right underneath my eye, almost lost my eye. So these are the things in which uh, emotionally I had to not only learn to overcome, but had to move past. And uh, it was very 
challenging and I started failing algebra, geometry, calculus and chemistry and it wasn't until a teacher in 11th grade offered tutoring for people who needed help and I looked at that as an opportunity. Uh, sometimes we have to literally uh, take the step forward even though we don't necessarily know what's going to happen and I looked at this opportunity and the, um, uh, the gas attendant on the corner knew that I in, really enjoyed going to school and this was during the winter break and uh, he gave me a dollar thirty five each way to catch the bus two hours so I could sit with the teacher one hour each day for these 30 days and in that 30 day process I realized I was smart and that I could actually do things with my life and even though I had failed mathematics and all these things and I'd gone through those very tough things in in, in growing up I could still overcome my fear and create a life for myself and, and that's what I ended up doing and I later on went to Cal State Northridge as a um, math major and ended up graduating top of the class and that led me to um, my role at the age of 21 launching rockets. It's interesting you know you grew up I mean I'm, I'm guessing you grew up where fear was almost like your norm do uh, you know what? It's interesting. Uh, because I've lived through it, because I've literally lived in a war zone, um, because I've feared so many things, I, it, learning to become a rocket scientist was a way that I had to learn how to reprogram my own brain and, uh, it, and become a master at psychology, not on other people, but myself. And in the process of uh, doing that, it was I was really hit with a big epiphany when I went to work with other scientists because they didn't have that <laughs> a thought process. They, they had never experienced anything like that. And uh, so I got a chance to sit with other people and pick their brain and I sat with geniuses. And I really had the opportunity not only to understand how my brain was working and how I had to connect it, but also I found out the ways the, the ways that geniuses think. Now, people would look at me and think, oh, you're a genius because you were a rocket scientist. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> I wasn't a genius always at first. I had to learn to become one. And that's what people uh, don't realize. You don't, you're not necessarily, everyone is born a genius. It is fear that gets in the way of your ingenious uh, inventions. And uh, when I had the opportunity to work with the other scientists and, and see their the way that they think, which was completely different than what I thought, I started putting the pieces together. What makes someone succeed in one area versus what makes someone not succeed in another? And it, it was the, not only the fear, but it was the traumatic situations that we have replaying in our brain over and over again that literally has a see one reality that's not accurate. And in the process of, of working with these genius engineers, I realized, huh, there's, there's, there may be something to this of me having to reprogram my own brain and, and then watching these genius individuals create ground, literally create a, a two-story engine from a dream. And I, and I realized that there is a, a process to to actually taking ownership over your brain and actually healing it. And I, I thought this was just a theory until uh, 2000, 2004. And uh, in 2004, uh, my mother had a major accident. And in that accident, uh, she had to go through brain surgery. And in going through that brain surgery, uh, I and my youngest sister helped our mother relearn how to walk, talk, eat, and sleep. and uh, I just completely uh, learn how to operate again, which things that we take for granted. And in the process of not only changing my own life and my own thinking, but working with a scientist and then working with my mother to help her reconnect her brain with her neurologists and, and uh, surgeons, I realized there's actually a science to this. And that's what led me to create my uh, new book, Answers Unleashed. So I was really thankful to do that. So when you were sitting with these scientists and these mm -hmm. geniuses, are, are you saying that they, they had fear or are you saying that they didn't? Uh, it was interesting. They had a different type of fear. Every
Everyone encounters fear. No one is immune. Every single person on this planet has gone through painful experiences, and it doesn't matter what type of experience it is. Everyone has their own experiences that they have to overcome. And uh, my situation is no different than another person's situation. Everyone goes through something that's very rough that defines their character or they allow to define their character. And uh, the fear that uh, people have, it, it, it all ranges. Everyone has everything from the fear of not being able to, uh, for example, there was a, the man that I worked for, he was brilliant. He's now one of the, uh, I'm so thankful he's now at Blue Origin doing great things. And he uh, was at the time my manager and he would create and lead these teams to create these brilliant uh, technological devices. But his fear was he had a, a son and he feared not being able to take care of his son who had special needs, as well as taking care of his work. So his priority was finding a way to be able to balance the two. And his, his fear was he wasn't gonna be able to help people create these large inventions, as well as take care of his, his special needs son. And uh, when I worked with individuals that had their own types of fear, like uh, there was this another individual who uh, was uh, brilliant. He was the lead designer of the entire uh, engineering a group of 200 people. And he would have these dreams of literally putting these large uh, engines together. And his fear was nobody was going to follow him or believe him, or no one was actually going to work towards that particular concept that he was convinced that would work. And later on, it was invented and it did fly. Uh, but his his fear was no one would be able to believe in his vision. So it was interesting because I came across, it didn't matter what someone's background was, everyone had a fear. And then when I worked with my mother, her fear was she wasn't going to recover. And so she actually made a decision that no matter what, she was going to heal. And it was that decision-making aspect of the brain that people decide I'm going to heal my brain or I'm going to balance this and take care of my family and lead people or and it's like this decision I'm going to share my vision no matter what happens it was that defining decision moment fractal moment that I call in the brain that helps someone change their life it is that decision moment in time where you choose the path and what you want to go on so I have you know it's interesting because when I'm listening to you I'm, I'm remembering the name of our talk show because our talk show is breaking free and part of my message and why I created this show, why we created this show, was because I felt that people were living their life in fear and which was mm -hmm. stopping them mm -hmm. from doing the things that they would have, that they wanted to do. And it was allowing them to listen to people that maybe they shouldn't be listening to. And I wanted to show people like you that were doing things, saying things. Somebody who had a tool, a technique, a strategy, had lived there, done that, doing something else. Somebody that was, you know, was a role model. So that, and it, so it, in essence, it's all, it was all, it, it's all educational to a degree, empowering, inspiring. But in the reality, showing you to the world says, oh, look, look what she's saying. Okay, so maybe I can break free a little today, which is also, which a little is a lot. You know, so that's why we, you know, we started the show was because of you, in essence. Well, thank you. Right? <laughs> well, I, I think it's a teamwork effort. Uh, there's people like me and there's people like you. Uh, together, it's, it's in it. People realize that we, there's connections between all of us. All of us are helping one another. And when we can actually see the world like that right. in, in being able to see what is the piece that I'm contributing to the world that no one else brings? What is it that is my gift that I bring to the world? When we understand what the gift is, then that's when we realize, huh, I actually have something that I can provide. And it, it suits and it fulfills a purpose that we have in life. Uh, you mentioned about fear, and fear is actually a real tangible thing. Yes. Uh, and if I could break down the science of it, uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf, uh, in her books, uh, recognized that there was some sort of uh, chemical reaction and dark type of magnetic energy that was happening within the brain. It was first a theory. Uh, she said that any type of uh, emotion, negative emotion that we experience during any type of stressful situation, 
uh, creates a, a, a a dark mass in the brain. And the, just to let the audience know, there are over 1400 chemical reactions in your brain when you experience fear. Your heart rate goes up, cortisol goes up, uh, you experience higher temperatures in your body. You literally are creating a chemical reaction. And so this was all just a theory for years until uh, just recently in 2000, uh, wow, I can say this 2017 since we're now in 2018. <laughs> Uh, 2017, uh, Dr. Ann McKee uh, was able, she's a neuropathologist who was able to cut open the brains of, of uh, NFL players who had concussions. And in doing so, uh, she noticed this dark tar-like mass that was literally sticking the brain together and it wasn't allowing the brain to actually reshape and heal itself. See, our brain is naturally supposed to reshape and heal itself, but it only does that when it doesn't have the presence of fear. And, and that's what the, the big thing was. And so I recognized that this CTE, which is uh, what the NFL players were going through and what was uh, just breaking down their brains from physical impact, it's still a type of impact. Emotional impact has the same type of, of uh, destruction in the brain as well. And fear is a type of emotional impact that literally creates what I call in my book brain brink. It's a dark tar-like mass that keeps the brain uh, stuck in a certain position. It's almost like a glue. Like when you go through a several, uh, difficult, like stressful situation, you're, you can come apart literally. And so your, your body naturally creates this glue-like mass in, in, in substance in your brain from those chemical reactions to keep you together. But once that fear is gone, that type of glue is supposed to completely come out of your system, come out of your brain. And your brain in my book, not only is in your head, but the brain branches down into the body through your nervous system. And that's what I introduced as what I call the three-sided brain, the Tria brain. So this dark tar-like mass brain brink that I call is like this glue that keeps you together in stressful situations, but it's not supposed to remain there. Meaning you are supposed to transform your thoughts to overcome the fear and overcome the past negative experiences. So you can actually reshape your brain. We all have the ability to do that with our thoughts. And in this book, I, I share about how our thoughts actually convert this brain brink into, uh, it melts it. I mean, that strange, sounds strange, but it literally our thoughts literally melt this substance and it can exit our body. And in exiting our body, we can actually choose the thoughts and use the energy from any type of situation to literally reshape the brain inside out. In doing so, we become confident and courageous in sharing our gifts to the world so we walk in our life purpose. Right. Yeah, that's very well said and partly a reason for, sh you know, introducing various guests to the show because each time we do that, I feel like we're helping people see another possibility. Which, yes, we are. Right? Which helps them, you know, with their choices and their intention. And yeah. of course, I, I, I feel very strongly about the heart having a mm -hmm. huge role in how mm -hmm. we, how we know. Yes. You know, yes. how we, how do I know what you're saying when I'm in fear? If I mm -hmm. was in fear today, mm -hmm. and I'm sure I have fears up here, right? But strong fear today. How do I know that I can listen to you? Mm. Where it's, is it's that coming from? Uh, d this is what's really fascinating, and psychologists have known this for a long time. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is able to determine when someone has disassociation, mm -hmm. meaning that when they go through a very stressful, just tough, stressful situation, especially at an early age, they create almost like different personalities inside of themselves. And it's not anything drastic, but it's like a personality that help you deal with a certain situation. Like for example, if a, a girl is neglected as a young child, uh, then she learns to uh, later on have a personality where she neglects other people because that's how she has learned how to deal with certain situations dysfunctionally. So there's different types. Anytime we go through a very tough situation, there's different parts of our 
that character that will come out to try and handle a situation. But if we are not aware of that, the fear is actually happening in our brain, literally in our reptilian part of our brain, we then are not uh, uh, taking ownership over changing the way that we are thinking about situations. And sometimes we will have different voices and it's actually now normal. I mean, people sound strange, you know how you <laughs> see like the, the little angel on the one yeah. side and the little devil on the other on um, people's <laughs> shoulders. You always see that in like the cartoons and everything. Uh, it is actually true. When we go through very stressful situations, the, whatever fear that has happened during that stressful situation becomes locked in the brain. That thought literally is locked and it's locked by that glue. And that thought literally is converting energy in your brain to, to go in a place that it's not supposed to. So we create these blocks in our brain. And so when we become aware of the gift that we actually are, are giving, when we, have, when we decide to have a purpose, when we have an intent, I'm going to be the best speaker on the planet to be able to help people overcome fear, or I'm gonna become the best CEO to be able to lead tons of people to be able to create great things in their life. When we make a decision about what it is that we're going to do in our life, that intention then takes uh, all the fear thoughts and it makes you become aware of them. Is this a thought that's going to help me to become a great CEO? Or is this a, a thought to help me get stuck always in situations? I love, so, I love yeah. what you said that we're born, everybody's born genius. Yeah, Did you say are. that? I think, yeah, everyone's yeah. Born a genius. yeah. You know, I've often thought to myself sometimes, and I've said it on air, you know, some, I, I call some, some things when we have a memory of something, for instance, or an intuitive kind of notion, I'll, I'll call them fleeting moments of genius, mm. right? And it, for me now, when you're saying that, and I love what you said about the genius, is that it's fleeting moments of who we are. Because mm. we are, I love that, we are born genius. Mm -hmm. it, that's a bril that's we're, brilliant. We're born perfect. We're born perfect. We're born perfect. And even if someone has a so-called uh, mutation in a gene, it's still perfect. Right. It's but still perfect. perfectly created because whatever that is that you're born with is to suit you in your life purpose on executing a plan. And not only the reason people, when they say life purpose, woo, woo, woo. No, no, no. Life purpose is inventing a future. Things that are tangible changing physical situations, not only with science, but with life, where you not only create a thought, you build it. So it's, it, rocking in life purpose is using the, uh, I'm a very spiritual person in recognizing the thought that you have been given. It's a, it's a blessing to think and to, to live. Using a thought that you can, an idea, and creating it so it is actually real. And, and that's the, that is the, the nature of invention. And that's what I saw all these scientists doing. That's what I saw my mother doing, inventing her new brain. <laughs> so you're you know, amazing. Like, to, so, so here's something amazing. Mm -hmm. So from, again, what I'm hearing you say, and I would love you to clarify it. And I also would love to hear how you, what you built and how your steps, because I'm imagining you know, hidden figures is like, was a big deal for you. So when you, so different, so people have fear, right? And there is fear is fear, but there's different purposes or realities in that fear. And some fear is like do or die, you know, like yours to me sounded like do or die. You either yes. did it or you died. And then other Hold people, oh, sure. See, she's My a very eyes. famous, popular person. A phone's ringing. It's okay. So she had. So her fear is based somewhat on do or die. Other people's fear is maybe the fear of the sun or the fear of this or the fear of that. And it's it's it, it's creating that intention, but it's um, different than that. And her fear is do or die. And it, it, maybe that's what it takes sometimes is that notion of do or die. It, it's it's interesting because our fears are um, our fears are built around our life purpose. 
I mean, that sounds odd. Uh, like for the, for the longest time, uh, I'll take myself and my life, for example. After uh, being stabbed in the face, I had a fear of being seen. <laughs> and I had a fear of uh, being seen and seeing things in certain ways. And so it, 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 the fear that I had to learn how to overcome is uh, allowing myself to be seen. And that was part of my life purpose is to write books, to be a public speaker, to to be out in the world helping people understand what it is that uh, they can do. Our fears usually are tied up into almost sabotaging us from our life purpose. So whatever fear that you're experiencing, it's more than likely uh, trying to keep you from moving forward in your life purpose. Like for example, if you are a woman who is caught up with a, a man and, and, and you really want to be in a relationship with him, but he uh, doesn't necessarily see your worth, for example, and you fear, uh, you, you wanna be in the relationship with him, but you have a fear of being in a relationship. That that actually is one of the most uh, just natural things that a lot of women go through. It's because they have a fear of being in a relationship with themselves, loving themselves deeply. And when you love yourself deeply, that's when you can actually see all the different possibilities that are at your, your uh, feet. Uh, whenever we have a fear of, let's say in the case of a romantic relationship, it is keeping us from moving forward in loving ourselves and creating our best possible life. And that is, that is one of the most uh, primal and heart examples that exist. If someone has a fear of, let's say, their child and their child not listening to what it is that uh, they're guided to do, uh, that more than likely is replaying, recurring and bringing up fears of what you experienced in your own childhood. And so addressing the fears that you had and experienced in your own childhood then would uh, alleviate your own stress. And so you would be able to guide your child to make decisions not based on fear and his. So it, it just, it is, uh, the fear is actually a tool for us to understand uh, how to take a thought and take a situation, past, present, or future, and change our thoughts around it so the energy from the situation then can reshape our brain to unleash the life that you want for yourself. So fear has to exist, but once you recognize that it is a fear, then you take ownership over your own life and your own thoughts and your own power, and you take your power back and use your power to create the things that you've always wanted to. It's a great visual when you think about, you know, going with the fear and then the energy and it's kind of becomes like a circle. I want to show your book. Yeah, so let's you. show Olympia's, oh, it's a beautiful cover. Lovely. Thank you. Thank Answers you. Unleashed. Thank you. Um, thank you for seeing that. I, I love the cover because uh, the red background is explosive. And I wanted to go with that idea of uh, being explosive. And I also use the red background for uh, the neurons in the brain and how blood flows. Uh, but also I liked uh, the, the background of how uh, we merge the idea of, of neurons in the brain and blood flow with outer space, with the different stars. Uh, when I realized that outer space and the world and the universe is really in our head, all the different types of stars that exist in the universe is mimically created in our brain. Our brain is like a little miniature universe. And <laughs> not to sound funny, but we have planets in our brain. <laughs> you know, we have, but we don't recognize it as such. It is a, it's a form of itself. But there's, in chaos theory, there is similar parts to the world and to the universe. Uh, like, for example, the, the pathway inside of an oyster is the pathway that exists that engineers get to Mars. And so realizing that uh, our brain is a miniature universe, uh, we have the ability to create, birth, 
kind of explode different ideas and in, in things. And so that red background of the cover indicates how we have the universe inside of us. And uh, taking yin access to that and giving birth to that is what life is all about. Well, you're, this is a perfect time for us to be talking about this, I think. So tell me about mathophobia. Why that? Oh, thank you. Uh, mathophobia. Mathophobia is my first book. Uh, it is geared towards uh, pre-college and college students and returning students who want to overcome their fear of mathematics. And uh, that's actually what first really started uh, getting me down the branch of neuroscience because I wrote this book. It's all a math book to help people ace mathematics, but none of the book is math. It's all written in English. And it was using psychology and self-programming neuroscience to allow someone to decide that they were going to be great at mathematics, but not only that, figuring out how their brain worked with the Myers-Briggs personality types to understand how to study mathematics in a way that was actually going to be beneficial for them. Because no two brains are alike. Never. There's no one that will ever think the same way that you do. So, And there's no one that will ever see the same world as you do. So why study it the same? Why not master how you see the world and study whatever it is that you study based on how you work and how to capitalize on your own thinking power. So the book uh, indicates the different types of fears that we face when we try and solve problems. And although the book is geared towards mathematics, it's really geared towards how anyone dysfunctionally tries to attempt to solve problems if they don't know what to do. Uh, the first person is Quincy the quitter. He'll quit before he even tries. The second person is uh, Donna the overdoer. She will try and try and try and still miss the mark. There is Quincy, the, oh, I always say Quincy, but there's Samuel the Struggler. His brain thinks differently and, and operates differently than everyone else. And he thinks he's dumb, but really he's a genius Einstein in disguise. Uh, there is Crystal the Criticizer. She's afraid to become a beginner, so she blames everyone else and points a finger because she doesn't necessarily know what to do. Uh, so there is all these different categories that we all fall into. Every single one of us has gone into one of these categories. And these categories are uh, very fascinating because when we recognize that, oh my gosh, I'm being Quincy the quitter here, or oh my gosh, I'm being Donna the overdoer. Uh, when we recognize that we have these different patterns that we sometimes can fall into, when we become aware of that, then that's when we can actually take ourselves out of that thought process and decide, okay, I'm going to reprogram my brain right here and then. I'm going to take out this thought. I'm going to put another one, and I'm going to operate with this new thought. When we do that, uh, we then learn to remove our fear. And the TED Talk, uh, Reprogramming Your Brain to Overcome Fear, literally is the adult version of that book that was created for kids. <laughs> People don't realize that. But yeah, the book that was created for college students, uh, it, the same message is created for the TED Talk in which nearly a million people have seen. So it's yeah, I'm just really thankful to be able to share that message. Yeah, it's, you know, it's great because... One of the things I'm noticing as we're sharing and I'm, I'm listening to you is, you know, it's so important that we realize that the, the stigma around fear or all of the stuff and, and to have a sense of humor and to know you're not alone. That oh, these no. things, you know, yeah, like there's a process and there's a reason, somewhat yeah. of a reason. And it's acknowledged, it's realized. Go ahead, say it. I don't want, go ahead. Say it, Olympia. It, it, uh, you see everyone with the Me Too movement, like, oh, yeah. my God. That's right. but people are shocked when they find out that they're not alone. And they're, like, comforted when they find out they're not alone. I, and so my TED Talk, and I share about my experience as a rocket scientist, and in my new uh, Answers Unleashed live video that's on my site, I share about how I, too, was in that situation where I was sexually abused uh, by a friend of the family who I trusted when I was eight. And so uh, people, when they're like, oh, they're running out, oh my gosh, and you still became a rocket scientist. It is because people like myself who have gone through different situations, who have gone through very tough situations and had to find a way to keep yourself together despite anything that was happening. It is because of people myself and the people who speak up and share no matter what has happened, no matter what you have gone through, you still can create a life for yourself, and it's your life. It's not someone else's. It's not what someone else did. It's not what anyone else uh, has chosen to do or have kept you from or taken away. 
you always have the ability to recreate. You can recreate your life in a way in which is meaningful and powerful and sharing your own story, being honest with whatever it is that's happened in your life and sharing how you have come to become stronger in a positive way from it. That is what allows you to heal and allows everyone else to hear simply by knowing that you exist. So I'm really happy to, to share that, not only in the talks, that uh, the Answers Unleashed Live talks that I do, uh, but with, with everyone, no matter what you've gone through, you have the ability to completely take ownership over your future and create the future that you want. And in doing so, you change lives, not only your life, but you change the lives of every single person that sees that you exist. And when you do, and as you do, here's a home for you. You just, <laughs> as you're doing it, and it does, you know, here's the thing, it doesn't, you don't have to go from A to Z. I'm happy <laughs> if you're going from A to C to from B, whatever it is, because all those experiences that you're having along the way is, I, I, I love to hear about it, and I love to bring it on here, because it's like, I, I use the example of losing weight. You don't <laughs> have to wait till you lose the 20 pounds to know you lost the 20 pounds. You might as well enjoy the five pounds, the inch, the dress size. It doesn't have to be the whole bowl of wax. You know, and, and, you know, so and here's a Marilynism. And I have a lot of Marilynisms. That's, you know, one of my things. But my, one of my Marilynisms is whose fear are you fearing anyway? Because a lot yeah. of the fears that we experience or we think are ours are learned. And then yeah. they become our own mm. and so some yes yeah, some are ours some are ours because we've heard something you know so a, a lot of times they're not even really ours but before we go on i just there's so again okay, yeah, do it i can't stop you when your mouth's open go <laughs> i'll go ahead i love I'll, being I'll, on your show thank you so thanks. much I love, I love listening to you it's just it's just amazing to listen thanks. to you and, well, and your, uh, your takes on things. Uh, it is fascinating. If you saw last night Oprah, yeah. uh, the Golden Globes were last night, and uh, she had this stunning black dress on, and she had a black dress on for a certain message that she was telling uh, the world with the Me Too uh, concept. And it uh, the, the black dress she had on was absolutely stunning, and you also saw that she lost weight. It, but it's really amazing because I think part of the reason why everyone loved Oprah is that she was honest. She was honest with her struggles and she realized, oh, I'm not quite sure uh, how to t manage this, but you're going to see me fluctuate and I'm going to be working on it. <laughs> you know? And that was just so authentic for her. And it was something that was uh, that that was empowering for all the women to be able to see. Uh, when we uh, have thoughts, our thoughts not only a affect us, it actually affects other people. And this includes fear. Uh, in the book, Answers Unleashed, I, I show that there is a brain that we have and it extends in our entire nervous system and it goes throughout our entire body. And with this goes throughout our entire body, uh, it creates a, uh, a field. It's actually an energy field around you. So your thoughts are just not only in your head, they're actually around you in a field around you. And I show this using Einstein's theory of relativity and uh, chaos theory, mathematics. And so your thoughts are actually around you. And in this theory uh, of the tree of brain theory of relativity that I created, our thoughts shoot out. <laughs> and so we receive people's thoughts. Like for example, have you ever uh, thought about calling somebody? And then when you call them, you they're like, oh, I was just thinking about you earlier today. <laughs> right. It's, it's the, the natural part right. that our brain has. Mm -hmm. So just as we shoot out uh, good thoughts, we also shoot out fear thoughts too. And we have to recognize when a thought is ours versus when it's somebody else's. Right. And that's a natural function of the brain. We send out brain waves. I call them trigger brain waves that goes out into the world. And its function is actually to help us solve a problem. So if we're going through a really tough situation, we will send out an SOS like, okay, someone come and help me. I'm not quite sure how to get out of this maze. So our brain sends out this SOS message that I call a tree brain wave. So this tree brain wave goes out into the world. So you'll have actually three type of people that will approach you. You'll have someone who will approach you that has gone through what you've gone through and is willing to give you advice on how you can create your own answer to get out of 
uh, your own predicament and create the life that you want. Or you'll be given a, a person that is currently stuck in the same position you are and that will try and reinforce different fears that you have so you don't move forward. And then there's the third person that will come into your life. And the third person that will come into your life is someone who is the exact mirror image of yourself. And when you're looking at that person, you're like, oh, I wish they would do that. That's really a message for yourself, telling yourself what it is that you should do to move forward. So uh, we have actually thoughts we gain thoughts and for it's most important for us to recognize what thought is ours versus the thought that is someone else's when we know that a thought is someone else's that's when we become empowered to realize that's not my thought like for example uh if someone wants uh to be a a world traveler but their parents want them to get married and so all their entire life, they've been thinking about, okay, I, I need to get married because that's the right thing to do. Whose thought is that? Is that yours or is that your parents? Right. So that was me really last night, not Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. I, I, I have to say. So wait, wait hold on, because I want to um, just mention a few things again. We, I've, I've been so engrossed in this conversation, I haven't offered you all an opportunity again to come on in. So we do have some time left. So if you want to come and talk and ask a question, comment, whatever you like, please feel free. You can call in at 919-518-9773, or you can come in on Skype, and that's computers, that's plural, then the number two, K voice, and we'd love to have you come in that way. And again, we have our chat, and that's open, and it's live, and you can put your name in, sign in with a nickname. It doesn't have to be yours, and just come on in, and you can ask questions there. And just one more thing. I, I, I want to say this before uh, we go on with another piece. I am just for a second want to say about an uh, email marketing tool that I am using, and I want to suggest it, that all of you out there, if they're offering a special, it's all eye contact. It's great. And what I love about it is they handhold you, which I need when it comes to technology. So if you're interested, go to eye contact and use the code breaking free and you will get a special 30 day free use of it and they will handhold you. So it's very important to do that. Okay. Um, these thoughts, we are We're like a radio station. We are we are. We're a radio station sending out these radio waves and receiving them. So just remember that that's kind of like what I believe Olympia is saying is that we're sending out this information. Send out good stuff. Because well, in the mirror, yeah, in the mirroring, you're sending out, but you're receiving too. You want to receive good stuff back. <laughs> well, become aware of what you're sending out. And, and, yes. and when we're conflicted, we send out mixed messages. And that's, that's the most amazing thing. When we are conflicted, we send out mixed messages. We send out one message to stay stuck and one message to move forward. And so it's when we become aware of, the, of our own hidden thought, we then become aware of what message that we are to send out. Like, for example, uh, I really loved writing and I didn't necessarily know what to do and I didn't necessarily know that I could actually create my own publishing company and actually distribute books and and, and create uh, different educational products for people to understand how their brain works not only in the educational system but also in the, just the public so people can take a university education in easy to understand terms home with them so they can actually increase their own brain power. I didn't realize that I had the ability to do this and and it was uh, so fascinating because i um i at first was always trying to look for other people who can who can publish me or who can get this out there and who can do this and i didn't necessarily know that i was conflicted meaning i didn't know whether or not to go with a publishing company or this the couple of publishing companies that offered to publish my book or if I had the ability to do it on my own and I, I simply went to church and I uh, it, this is the craziest thing it was a pastor from years ago and I had uh, <laughs> I asked him uh, this is the craziest thing I, I asked him to endorse my book and he's like oh I can't do that and I'm like oh and I felt rejection at first I'm like why and this was my first first book. And I thought, Oh my God, why can't he do that? 
And then I thought to myself, maybe I can ask them for something else that's not that. And I said, can you pray for me? And if you can't endorse a book, can you pray for me? Can you pray that I will make the best decision for myself and what it is for me to do with my book? <laughs> and he's like, I can do that. And then uh, I actually through that realized I had the strength and the ability to create uh, a corporation, an educational corporation that was going to not only create this book, but later on generate things to be able to help people change their way of thinking, not only in mathematics, but across the board. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful for that prayer because it gave me the, the awareness in my own being that I had the ability to actually do this. And so I wasn't sending out mixed messages anymore, but rather determined on a pathway that I was going to make a difference in a new way, not necessarily in the same way in which I was used to, but a way that was actually going to work. And uh, the this is the craziest part about all of it, that that particular pastor left. There was a new pastor that came on board. And immediately I clicked with the new pastor and his family and his wife and, and the messages in which he was sharing about not only understanding how God exists in the big picture, and it doesn't matter what your background is, but understanding how we have a personal relationship with ourselves to fulfill godly purposes. And it doesn't matter if you're a Christian, it doesn't matter if you're Buddhist, it doesn't matter if you're a Muslim, but we have all the ability to, to give birth to great things, to leave this world in a way that's actually going to be better. And uh, when I, uh, told him about my second book and I'm like, oh, I'm creating my second book. Will you endorse this? He's like, where? Let me read it. Yes. <laughs> and it was, it was that, uh, I think I truly believe, uh, it was because of my, um, change in the self, in myself recognizing that, uh, I had the capabilities to create something of value. And when you have that idea and commit to that and believe that for yourself, other people will automatically want to follow on. And these are the people in which have the same vision as you. And so I think I truly believe that is the, the part is coming clear with yourself. So you don't send out the mixed message, but rather you connect with people with the same passion, the same vision. So you all together can build something that will leave a legacy. So let me ask you a, a quick question. And I, and, and, I, and I know this is not a quick answer, but if you can make it quick because I have another quick question to ask you after this. How soon after the Challenger did you start working for NASA? Oh, oh I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> I was nine years old when Challenger happened. Okay. It was January 28th, 1986. Okay. I'll tell you exactly when that was. I was, uh, I think I was nine years old. And uh, it, I was watching it. Uh, I didn't watch it at the time, but I watched it on reruns afterwards because that was when the first teacher went out into space and all the kids across the Los Angeles Unified School District and all across the entire school districts in the United States was watching this launch because the first teacher was going to go out in space. And that was a horrible event because, and I write about this in uh, my Huffington Post article uh, where I talk about the Challenger explosion. Uh, I think it was like Memories of Challenger Ignited. Uh, it was... Uh, 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 very tough to watch. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about the history of what happened, uh, there was several astronauts uh, ex were killed in this particular launch. And I was just so floored and, and saddened and moved by their deaths. And what happened was that uh, there was a couple malfunctions that had happened and there was a, a scrubbed launch, meaning that they did laid the launch several days uh, to try and fix the problems. And the last day they decided to launch, even though it was below freezing temperatures. And if you know about metal, metal uh, expands and contracts with different temperature extremities. Uh, for example, if you put a uh, soda can in a freezer, it's going, the metal's really going to get cold and the pressure's going to change and may explode. So uh, it's similar if you put a metal on uh, a flame, it's going to expand because of the heat. So metal actually changes based on the heat environment that it's in. So there was this O-ring. It was like this metal type of uh, ring that held the, it was like a, a metal type of, of ring that held uh, the solid rocket booster together. And so when they launched the, the rocket in the below freezing temperatures, the O-ring 
uh, metal warped. It became uh, deformed and it tilted to the side. And when it tilted to the side, there was a gap of uh, propulsion. The, the solid rocket fuel that was inside the the uh, rocket went into a place it didn't, and it caused the entire uh, solid rocket to explode. And it tilted, and when it tilted, it pierced the external tank, and the external tank was like the gas tank. It carried the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and that pierced that, and the entire the entire uh, spatial exploded in in midair. And the astronauts died, and it wasn't during that explosion. The the capsule that they were in actually could take that type of withstand that type of explosion, but it couldn't withstand a fall into an ocean. And so the capsule that the astronauts are in uh, propelled and it fell to the ocean and it cracked open like an egg. And so the, the astronauts died upon impact uh, as the capsule fell into the ocean. And then they, if they didn't die upon impact, they drowned because water got into the capsule. So Olympia, you really, and, and we're unfortunately almost out of time, but you oh, really... Yeah. In the position that you were in, you must have lived on some kind of high alert in the kind <laughs> of business you were in and, yeah. and with history and all that you, you, know, you were involved with, you would have to find or mm -hmm. understand a method of keeping yourself straight. I, from that example that happened at nine years old, I made the decision that someone had to be out there helping people live their life purpose. And so there were astronauts that had to live their life purpose. And at that time, I told myself I was going to do anything and everything to make sure that astronauts were going to be able to live their life purpose. And that later on led me to the exact department, the exact department really? in rocket science to prevent that. And now I'm helping people live their life purpose in a new way. With all your experiences, but of course... <laughs> so, bef be okay, so we so tell everybody where they can get their book and know more about you. Oh, great. Uh, find me anytime. Find me on AnswersUnleashed.com. That is the main website uh, to for you to find out all about how to change your brain. And find the book, AnswersUnleashed.com. We have the book. We have the live uh, lectures on there. It's a free live lecture you can check out and learn about the brain. Uh, you can always find me on olympialapointe.com and always like my Facebook site, facebook.com slash olympialapointe. And you can always, always find me on Facebook. Shoot me a message. Say hi. Tell, tell me what it, it is that you have enjoyed. I typically respond to people so <laughs> because I, I love helping people. So uh, I'm just very thankful to be in this type of work. Well, we are so um, honored that you are the kind of person, woman that you are, and you believe in what you do, and that you were here today, and we're sharing with us, and it's been, it's fabulous, and I'm glad, you know, it's wonderful to know that there, are, you know, you get to see people that are out there doing the work, and they're right in front of you, so Thank you. connect with her, she means it, and once again, eye contact is great if you have email marketing, any kind of marketing like that, it's great, they handhold you, that's very important to me, because I don't want to do it. I want to be handheld and I want somebody to help me. So breaking free is the code and they'll give you a free trial and there'll be lots of help. And then I'm done. Pop up my book. Do you have it? Okay. This is, and this was my version of, you know, talking to men, breaking free men that were showing how they did their things. I interviewed 22 men. It's called in just one afternoon, listening to the hearts of men. And it's on Amazon soon. My next one will be in just one afternoon, listening to the hearts of twins. So we'll be on the lookout for that. In the meantime, one, just a small little statement from you, Olympia, about a word of wisdom or a little phrase of wisdom from you in closing. Today yep. is a new day. Amen. Anything that's happened in the past is the past. There is always a future for you. Nice. Hold on to it, take it, feel it, smell it, and accept it as yours. And I say amen to that. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here today and sharing uh, your work with us. Uh, her books sound are, are really terrific. They sound great. I would suggest 
you all go check them out. And I know, and there's a lot more in it that we've discussed. Yeah. Oh, right? Yeah. Oh, tons and tons <laughs> of experiences and information and breaking down how you do it and yeah. more information about that. So please go take, check them out. And I am always here for you as well, Marilyn at MarilynShannon.com. And I will see you all next week. So, Olympia, thank you so much for being here. It's been an honor. Everybody out there, thanks for spending your time with us. Bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net. <laughs>